Hello everyone, I'm Jamie Anderson watching Get Your Sacks Together and this is my first ever live, so exciting times. Somebody let me know in the comments if uh, you can hear me okay. There's going to be a bunch of tech stuff going on, so it's going to be flying by the seat of my pants today. Um, so just bear with me as I try and field everything coming in. So today we're going to learn about the Get Your Sacks Together theme tune that you hear on all these videos. So I'm going to teach you all the sax parts. You're going to learn it on alto. You're going to learn it on tenor. And I'm going to tell you all about a fantastic competition which is going to come up as well, where you can win a 45 minute lesson with me, all exciting times. So first of all, let's cover a few little village parish notices, shall we? First of all, go and get the PDF for this lesson, for this live. And if you're on the uh, watching on the replay, go down to getyoursaxtogether.com forward slash theme tune. That link is also in the description. That has got all the parts for this written out, the algebra parts, the tenor parts, it's even got the Barry part. So that's a fantastic resource. I've also given you the concert pitch score, which is very exciting. So you can see exactly how I recorded this originally. Second thing I want to let everyone know about is my free one hour masterclass. This is my gift to you, beautiful people. And I can see there's a load of people writing comments, which is fantastic. Hello to everyone. <laughs> Might well sounding good. Thanks very much. Got your message. Great stuff. Yeah. This is all I could pack in about teaching saxophone in a one hour class. Go to getyoursaxtogether.com forward slash masterclass. That link is also in the description. There's stuff there on gear, breathing, setup, embouchure and throat, body position, tone, getting a great tone, scales, how and what to practice, improvising, and a bunch of other really handy pro tips and tricks that I've picked up over the years. So. Click the link in the description or go to uh, getyoursaxtogether.com forward slash forward forward slash forward slash masterclass. Now, the third thing I need to tell you about is this exciting giveaway. So I'm going to teach you how to play the theme tune and then you guys can go away and record it yourself. But don't worry, I'm going to give you the drums and the baritone sax part. So if you play alto or tenor, you're covered. Now, the version that I like the best I'm gonna give that person a free 45 minute lesson, which is exciting via Zoom. The competition closes, you've got a week to do it. The competition closes on July the 3rd at 11.59 p.m. GMT London time. So drop me an email, info at getyoursaxtogether.com. You can either send me an MP3 or a private YouTube link or something like that. You'll need some kind of multi-track software to record it. You can either record it with four alto parts, if you only play alto, four tenor parts, if you only play tenor, or you can do two altos and two tenors if you play both. Now, you only need to record the first little piece. You don't need to record the extra bit that you hear at the end uh, for the credits and bloopers in my videos. You can if you want, <laughs> and that would be a particularly good bonus if you did that, but I'm only gonna judge the first little piece. So. Let's talk about this Get Your Sacks Together theme tune, shall we? Now, the important thing about this theme tune is to understand about unison and harmony. So, what is unison and what is harmony? Quite simple, unison is when all the saxes or horns or instruments in an ensemble are playing the same note. Now, it could be the sa exactly the same note, which is called perfect unison, or it could be in octaves higher or lower, which is called octave unison. That means you're all playing the same note, and that is a really, really strong way of arranging an ensemble. So that's your number one go-to. Second of all, if you use harmony, then you can split all the notes of the chord between the different instruments of the ensemble. Now, in this case, there's five saxophones in this tune. Two altos, two tenors, and baritone sax down the, back, down the bottom. So what I did when I composed this tune, I had to decide what notes are going to be unison and what notes are going to be split into harmony. So let's have a little look here. What you can see here is the notes which are boxed in red. I've got the split harmony. Sometimes that's called soli, sometimes it's called divisi. The notes which are in blue are unison. So as you can see, da -da -da -da, that part of the tune is all in harmony. Then briefly it goes to unison, da -da -da, and then split harmony, da -da -da and then unison right to the end. 
So that is how I decided to mix up the unison and the harmony in this theme. So if you're practicing it, you'd record the top line, and then some of the time you're playing the same notes, and then some of the time you're playing different notes as you split into the harmonies. So if you have to arrange something yourself, you have to make decisions about when you're going to harmonize notes and when you're going to do unison. And if you don't know, just stick with unison because it can be a bit gnarly trying to harmonize a four part chord and that can be quite advanced. Right, let's have a look at the main melody, shall we? This is the main top line being played on alto and it sounds like this. I've written in the pitches, so if you don't read music, you can still see the notes. What I don't have is the actual fingerings but hopefully you can look it up if you don't know the fingerings. So I'm gonna play this for you. Hopefully the tech will work out. I'm gonna play this slowly for you on alto, here we go. So that's what it sounds like in slow motion. I'm just gonna point out a couple of small things. The first one is in the second bar or second measure, if you're American, you can see that little squiggle. That is called a turn between the C and the B flat. I just put a little D flat in there. The second thing to point out about this lead line is in the beginning of the second line, there's a fall off that G. Now I've got a whole video on falls, scoops, bends, all that. I'm not quite sure if I can add a card to this video later for the replay people, but if I can, I'll put a card now. Uh, but it's quite a quick one because you've got to get off it quick for the next line. So in this case, I wouldn't do a fingers down kind of ripple off. I would just do a kind of throat off. Bow. <laughs> I'll try and demonstrate. <laughs> okay, so that's what I would do in that one. And finally, the third last note has got brackets around it. Now, we call that a ghosted note, which means you barely play it. You play it, but it's a lot quieter than the other notes. So, so that D, you don't play it as loud as the F, the F sharp, and the G. So it should sound like this. Jake Brown, hopefully that answers your question. He was asking about what the bracket around the D is. So now I'm going to play the lead alto line, the main melody of the song, uh, slowly one more time, and then I'll play it at full speed for you. Here we go. So that's what the main melody sounds like. Um, incidentally, in the uh, second line, second bar, you can see that B natural there's got a bend up to it. I would do that with the bis key going from the B flat to the B. So I just do that with the button. Incidentally, all the other B flats I play on this on alto are with the bis key. The bis key is that little tiny key next to the B key. Unless there's a reason not to, I always use bis key B flat. So that is the lead alto line, right. If you're gonna play along with the video for fun, that is the melody that you'd use. Let's have a look at that on tenor now, shall we? I'll get my tenor. This is exactly the same melody. Obviously the notes are higher because we're now in tenor transposition. Same things apply with the turn. Okay. Now this time on the turn, you see in the second bar, second measure, uh, the third beat, you've got that high F and then a turn to the E flat. Now I'm playing the front F. For those of you that don't know what a front F is, it's like a second octave A, but you move your first finger up to that button. Some people have a brass button, some people have a pearl. I've got a Selma Mark VI, which has got a pearl. So I would do the front F, then I'd briefly hit the G flat, 
by playing it with my first finger and the side B flat key. So that's how you handle that little corner if you're playing the main melody on tenor. I'll play it one more time for you slow and then one more time at full pelt. <laughs> Incidentally, that isn't the tenor line that I played when I recorded this. That is just the tenor playing the top melody. Okay, which brings me on to talk about the harmonies in this little riff. Almost all of this riff is on the blues scale, with the exception of one or two little notes here and there. So let's talk about the harmonies in this particular piece. So remember I said that sometimes it's split, and sometimes it's unison. So when it splits, there are four harmonies, the top line and then three other harmonies, and then the baritone at the bottom, which is typically doing the root, which is what you would normally do. So let's have a look at the splits for the alto pitch. So what you don't see there is the top line. The top line is missing. We've already learned that. This is the all the other notes that you would play if you weren't playing the melody. Now then, You'll notice those little tiny notes in blue. They're just the unison. And you'll also notice that, excuse me, you'll also notice that half the melody is missing because the rest of it, after that piece of music that you're looking at, the rest of it is unison. So you don't need to worry about harmonies. Now this first chord has got a B flat in alto pitch at the top. So it's B flat, G, F, and B natural. Now that chord is called a G7 sharp nine for the, for the geeks out there, so the key thing about this chord is it's kind of funky and it sounds bluesy because you've got the B natural, which is the third of G7, and you've got the B flat at the top, which is a bluesy note. And then the next harmonized section just is a C triad to a B flat triad, and then the last harmonized note is a G13 for the geeks. So the melody note on that final chord is a G, so you'd have G, E is the, the 13, B is the third and F is the seventh. They are the harmonies for this piece. Now, just shortly, I'm gonna play the actual multi-track recording that I made on Logic, and you can hear all these parts one at a time, and they sound really ropey on their own. It's really embarrassing, but somehow, when you put them together, they sound super vibey. So that is the harmonies for alto. Let's have a look at the harmonies for tenor. Exactly the same thing in tenor pitch. Now, if you wanna enter the competition and you've only got a tenor, you would record the melody as I taught you and these would be the harmonies that you're gonna add. But it's all in the PDF in the description, which is at get your sax together forward slash theme tune. Okay, now, there's always a slight twist in the tail <laughs> because there's one little bit I didn't tell you about. <laughs> it's never that straightforward, is it? And that is this funky split um, multiphonic, it's called, high G on alto. And then there's this multiphonic high G, which you'll recognize from the theme tune. So what I do for this is I have one, three, one, three, which way to go? One, three, one, three on alto, and obviously the octave key. Now, if you just hit that, you'll get a high G, and if you relax your embouchure slightly and aim for a slightly lower note, it should split like a kind of Dave Sanborn multiphonic roar. <laughs> now, this isn't the most reliable note on the planet, so I am gonna demonstrate it, and I'm just gonna keep my fingers crossed, but apologies in advance if it doesn't come out first time. It's gonna be quite embarrassing, really, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> How rubbish was that? So that just goes to show it's not an easy note to hit. Sometimes if you hit it like at the end of a run, it's a bit better. I feel like I should have another go at that. Hang on. <laughs> I 
not the most reliable note of all time, but um, I'm just going to blame my reed like any good saxophonist. So that multiphonic G sits over the top of the melody as a kind of extra part. It was just a little ornamentation. And actually really quiet in the mix on the final two notes, there's a high A on alto, which is two, three, one, two, three, and a high B flat, which is three, one, two, three, and side C, both with the octave key. That came out well, <laughs> redeemed myself. <laughs> okay, that's buried in the mix. So the, the multiphonic G and the little A and B flat, but you don't, you don't need to play them <laughs> for the competition to win the, the lesson. That's just a bit of extra. Okay, let's have a look at the actual original recording which I made for um, the Get Your Sax Together theme. Now what I'm gonna do is, I'm just gonna briefly play each part one at a time, and then it'll be interesting for you to see how they build up. These parts are not exactly the same as the ones I've taught you, because the way I recorded it, I didn't even write it down, I just kind of vibed it, so things came out a bit different. Here is the first alto part. Let's hope this comes out, fingers crossed. There you go, and you could hear the G multiphonic in that. Now I'm gonna add in the second alto. <laughs> As you can tell, it sounds really messy, man. However, vibe trumps all. Love will conquer all. Vibe will conquer all when it comes to saxes. Now, I mentioned about that high A and B flat. I'm just gonna play it. You can hardly hear it, but it's kind of buried in there. <laughs> so I'll add that in. I'll also now add in the tenor. First tenor, here we go. Okay, it's coming together, man, it's coming together. Okay, let's add in the second tenor. So now we've got four harmonies. This should sound pretty banging now. Okay, starting to sound more like it. Now, the key ingredient here, of course, is the baritone sax. In fact, it's such a key ingredient. I'm just gonna play the baritone sax on its own first. Here we go, love baritone. <laughs> How cool is that? Right, so we'll add in the baritone and then it only leaves one thing to come, which is the drum. So here's all the saxes. And then the final icing on the cake is the drums and here's the whole thing. That is what you get. That's all the parts put together. And you know, the sum of the parts is better than the individuals, to, to be honest. Right, one extra thing that I'll just give you as a little bonus while I'm here, I'm with Vibin Live. Here are the sax parts for that outro when the, you know, the end of my videos with the credits. I recorded this later and tagged it on. Check this out. I've cut the drums out. Now, I have to admit, you know, everybody uh, everybody nicks stuff, don't they? I nicked this little bit here. Oops, I nicked this bit. If you go and listen to Come On, Come Over by Jaco Pastorius, the saxes do it in there. It sounds absolutely wicked, so I nicked that. Uh, that is the end piece, which I haven't taught you how to play, but it's just a little bonus. So here it is again with the drums. Just a little jam along there. 
Now then, that is all the parts from the original Logic file. So I thought you guys might be interested in that. Okay, let's have a look now at the details of the competition just to round off and then we'll get into a little bit of Q&A. <laughs> right, let's see if I can get back to the competition. Here we go. Sometimes I get a little warning that pops up, which I'll get rid of now. Okay, doke, so all you have to do is if you've got alto, you record four alto parts with the drums and baritone MP3 that you can download with the PDF from the link in the description. And if you've got tenor, you record four tenor parts, which is also in the PDF to the drums and baritone part. If you've got alto and tenor, you can do two of each, but it doesn't really matter too much. So you'll need a multi-track recorder like GarageBand, or you can get free things for your phone. It's like really easy to record multi-track these days. On the MP3, I'll give you a nice clear counting <laughs> so you don't need to worry too much about that. You wouldn't even need to put it on a grid, although it's 170 BPM if you do. Come, you've got a week to do it. Competition closes 11.59 PM GMT on Friday the 3rd of July, 2020. So apologies to replay people that that has expired. Uh, drop me an email, info at getyoursaxetogether.com. Tell you what, even if it's, it's, it's well, I can't get my words out. Even if it's expired, send your recording in anyway, because I'd love to hear it, because I'm enthusiastic about that kind of stuff. Now then, let's move on to some questions. Maybe there's something you've always wanted to ask about sax. Maybe there's one problem that you've never been able to solve. Maybe you've got a question about this piece or playing high notes or low notes or anything else that I've covered on my channel. If you can think of anything to ask me, I'm all yours. So. Oh yeah, I love the little echo there at the end. <laughs> Remember there's a bit of a delay in the broadcast. When I tested it, it was up to 20 seconds. So I'll give everybody a little bit of a chance in case they've got any burning saxophone problem they would like answered or any problem. I'll answer any problems about life in general. <laughs> Shout out to um, Oz, who I taught the other day. Hi, oh, my poor wife is going to suffer a lot when I attempt some of this. <laughs> That's brilliant. Anybody else with some partners who are going to suffer? Shout out to Phil, Darren, Judy LV, Eric C, Eduardo, Franz. Thanks, guys. Appreciate your support. Okay, little question here from Steve Treadwell. Is there a trick way of reducing spittle other than dehydration? Let's add that in there. Um... <laughs> Other than dehydration, that's an interesting concept. Uh, well, I have had this question once before about having a lot of spit in your sound. I mean, for me, I quite like it. I like that kind of, that spitty sound. Um, I'm not sure if I have a perfect solution for you there, um, apart from maybe the shape of your tongue and the way you've got your mouth, the spit is sort of flying up into the reed. So you could just try and experiment with that. That's not a very comprehensive answer, I'm afraid. I'd have to have, give you a bit of a one-to-one -one on that one, Steve. Uh, Jose, or Jose, Jose probably. Help on Altissimo, please. I'm gonna do a video on Altissimo in a couple of months. I'll cover all that there, but it's all about your embouchure, not the fingerings. So don't get too hung up on the fingerings. It's much more about your embouchure. You should just be able to, to play good altissimo, you should be able to just finger a low B flat and still get, if I get my tenor, I'll demonstrate that to play altissimo, you can just use one fingering and you should still be able to get the high notes, so. <laughs> back on. So Altissimo is all about how you have your embouchure basically and the shape of your tongue. So you need to angle your tongue high and down for the Altissimo notes as if you're saying E, E when you're blowing. And then for the low notes, you have your tongue like an aw oh sort of sound. Plenty of questions coming in now, which is great. Thanks very much, guys. What do I think of synthetic reeds, Phil? I don't really play them. I've never got on with them, but I wish I did because I would love to have a read that I could slap on and it's the same every time, especially working in theatres and things like that where you're changing instruments the whole time. That would be 
awesome. I know a lot of bass clarinet players use synthetic reeds, and increasingly I think they're getting better. They're, uh, they're inventing new kinds of synthetic reeds. So I'm all open to it. One of the things that puts me off is how much it costs for one reed if it doesn't work. I'm sure that's the same for everybody. Maybe I'll try and get an endorsement and do a proper video on it. Eduardo, yeah, Jamie, high notes. How to make them sound relaxed and steady? Well, making your high notes sound relaxed and steady is very difficult, I guess. Like I said, it's the same as the previous answer about Altissimo. Making that E shape with your mouth and changing the angle of the air is the key to Altissimo playing. But a lot of people asking about Altissimo, so I will definitely make you a great video on that coming up. Can you, Anlian, Anlian? Anlian, can you explain mouthpiece tip openings? Yes, I can indeed. First of all, I will tell you straight up, I am not the world's biggest sax geek. <laughs> However, I do know what the tip, note, tip opening is. Now, if I try and have my mouthpiece like this, you probably won't be able to see in the camera, but we've all got a saxophone that mouthpiece that we're familiar with. The tip opening is the gap between the bottom of the reed and the tip of the mouthpiece. Do you see that gap there? That is the tip opening. So that's how much, you know, if the tip opening is that much, your reed can vibrate like this. If it's only that much, your reed can only vibrate like that. So the tip opening is how much the reed can vibrate. So big tip openings are harder to play, but you get, you know, that bigger, louder sound. So that's the payoff about tip openings. Quite simple, really. Uh, what else we got here? When I play va Vadzim, Vadzim, when I play, it sounds like a robot. How to play with feelings? Hmm. That's an interesting question. Well, I always think, you know, one of the reasons people like saxophone is because you sound like singers. You sound like a vocalist. So if you concentrate more on sounding like a singer, hit the note, add the vibrato at the end, shape the phrase and get less concerned about the notes and the technicalities of the instrument, I think your playing will come out as being more lyrical. So don't be too, you know, don't spend too much time thinking about the technicality of it and the being the precision and all the, you know, that's for your studies and your technique practice. When it comes to performing music, you just need to relax and let the music flow a bit more. I hope that helps. When I play, it sounds like a robot. How to play with feelings, yeah. So just forget all you know and imagine you're just singing the melody. That's my advice on that one. Yeah, synthetic reads, user, user. Yeah, maybe I'll have a look at the synthetic reads for you guys. Daz Bolton, any PDFs on alternate fingerings for Altissimo? I struggle from G upwards on a tenor. Okay, when I do my Altissimo video in a few weeks, I shall give you fingerings for alto and tenor. In the meantime, there is a great book on the subject called Top Tones for Saxophone by Sigurd Rascha. That is the go-to manual on Altissimo playing, so go and check that one out. Tanya McLean, answer to spittle from session from a dentist. Answer to, I'm not sure exactly what that means. Uh, thanks very much, Phil Harris. Jan Jung, if you don't have a reed geek, what is the second best tool to use to correct duff reeds? Well, that's a good question because nobody used to have reed geeks until however many years ago. And people used to have a reed knife, which was just a very sharp craft knife. So that is your second best option on that one. Uh, Tanya McLean says, don't eat or drink anything other than the water before playing. It causes your mouth to produce more saliva. Ha <laughs> ha. So that is the answer to the question from, I'm just looking up to see who that was from, Steve Treadwell. You can thank, <laughs> you can thank, um, I've lost the comment now. Um, anyway, the answer is don't eat or drink things because your mouth produces saliva to, you know, to digest the food. So where are we? I've lost my place. Tanya McLean. Thank you, Tanya McLean, for that question. Okay, Jose, what's a good sax model, tenor or alto, for intermediate players who are wanting to play casually? Intermediate players, I would say a Yamaha is a pretty good bet. Um, the good news for us sax players is that there's a lot of really good saxes now at a very affordable price. Again, I'm not the ultimate gear guy, 
but um, a Yamaha 32 or a Yamaha 62 is a really good, really good tip. You can't go wrong with them, and they've got good resale value. If you're an intermediate, so they're not like a bargain basement, they're not super expensive, they're in the middle, that's a good tip. Is there a recommendation frequency to change reads like every hundred or every hundred hours? Okay, so Jeremy's asking, I'm not even gonna attempt that surname. Yes, I am, come on, let's do it. Vastesager, Vastesager. Sorry, Jeremy, I probably butchered that. Um, I just do it when I know that the, the read isn't really responding very well, and then I know that's it, and I just crush it. I never keep it. <laughs> I literally smash it with my hands so I don't play it again. I just burn my bridges, man. Um, I would say, well, obviously it depends. Yeah, you've said how many hours, which is a good measure instead of time, because you could be playing a lot or a little in that time. Currently, we are just coming out of COVID-19 lockdown, in case anybody out there hadn't noticed. So this is a weird time for musicians. I haven't played a single gig for three months. Get that. And nobody has on the planet, pretty much, as far as I know. So I'm not playing as much as I usually do. Um, therefore, my reads last longer. I would say just use your feel. Calculate it by feel. Adrian Pugh, how do you make the note die off? It sounds like you're using your tongue. Well, if you mean make the note quieter, then that's just you stop, you incrementally blow more gently. If you're talking about the note falling off, that's done with your throat. Maybe you can add a comment at the end about exactly what you mean on that one. Let's see if we can get a few more questions in here. Thanks for all your questions. This is awesome. Uh, and let me just read this while I take a little sip. Hold on there. <clears throat> okay, Eric C. I bought an Alto in November last year and got a tenor early this month. That's my birthday gift. That's awesome. I find it easier to play on the tenor especially notes after C sharp in the third octave. Okay, that's, yeah. It's actually easier to play higher notes on the bigger instruments, so that is normal, not really an embouchure problem. Is my Chinese sax and beginner mouthpiece holding me back? Thanks, Phil Harris. Phil, probably not the sax, because most saxes, as long as they don't leak, won't hold you back too much. Your mouthpiece quite possibly. Mouthpiece is far more important than saxophone, so I would have a look at changing your mouthpiece if I were you. All right, see. right, this is a good question. David Menery, how long did it take you to get used to push your bottom lip out instead of what we were all taught, rolling your lip of your bottom teeth? I'm so used to rolling my lip, yes. Ah, man, this is the bane of my life. It's a clarinet thing. Everyone is taught to curl their bottom lip over their teeth. That will cramp your sound and you'll, it's just bad news. So yeah, roll that lip out a bit. How long will it take to change? I don't know. You just need to make it a habit. Some people say it takes 21 days to change a habit. Others say it'll take you 10,000 hours to master a skill. I don't know how long a piece of string is, but however long it takes, you've got to do it. I'll show you the difference between clarinet embouchure and sax embouchure. Okay, check this out. This is with, first of all, I'll play with clarinet embouchure and then I'll play with saxophone embouchure. It's chalk and cheese. So that is why you have to roll that lip out and just keep your jaw nice and relaxed. Let that reed vibrate. Just let it go completely mad to get that big sound, as long as you can control it, obviously. Okay. Jan Jung, how important is it to be able to produce several different tones with the mouthpiece alone? That is very important. Great question. Thank you very much for that. I'll post that one up. Can somebody tell me in the comments if 
all the comments that you're posting are appearing on the screen because they're appearing on my screen. But I don't know if they're coming up for you. Um, I just posted that last question. That should be the only thing that you're seeing on the screen, but who knows? Maybe they're coming up underneath somewhere. I've never seen it myself. <laughs> okay, good question. It's very important to be able to produce lots of different tones because it gives you the flexibility in your jaw and your throat to bend notes and stay in tune and play vibrato and bend, scoop and fall and do all these cool things that you need to do when you play sax. You should be able to get at least an octave Now, if you can play Summer of the Rainbow on your mouthpiece, you are doing extremely well. If you can get an octave on your mouthpiece, that is absolutely fine. Even if you can get a fifth, it's better than nothing. So, very good question. It's very important to get a lot of different notes on your mouthpiece. Daz Bolton, do you recommend any mouthpiece for a dark sound? Well, the only thing I'd say on this topic is, well, I'll say two things. The first is that the sound in general, it comes from the person, not the instrument. If I took your saxophone and your mouthpiece and your reed and played it right now, after disinfecting it, because this is COVID, folks, I would sound very much like me. Wouldn't that be funny if you had exactly the same setup as me? But I doubt you do. <laughs> However, I could take any of your setups from anybody who's commenting and watching this video, and I'll play your sax, and I'll sound very much like me with some variation. By the same token, if you came right in here now and played my setup exactly as it is, you would sound very much like you. So that is the first point. The sound comes from you, not the setup. However, yes, the setup does make a bit of a difference. Now, traditionally, if you want a very bright sound, you'd have a mouthpiece with a stepped baff baffle inside the chamber. That means that when you look inside the mouthpiece, Instead of the chamber curving and then going like this, there'll be a sharp step, which uh, disrupts the air and gives you a bright sound. So a mouthpiece that just goes straight through without any steps in it will be darker, and a mouthpiece with an angle in it will be brighter. I hope that answers your question. I use uh, Jody Jazz Ebonite mouthpiece on my alto, and I use a vintage uh, Florida Autolink um, 8 or 8 star, I think, on tenor, both of which have got quite dark sounds because I like quite a dark sound. All right, how we done? I'll take a few more and then we'll wind it up, I think. When will you make an alto altissimo lesson? You rock, by the way. Thank you very much, One Stack One. Uh, yep, in a few weeks, it's coming up, uh, or at least a couple of months. I've got it scheduled. It's going to be popular by the look of it. <laughs> David Menery, do you spend lots of time practicing patterns to make melodic phrases? Sometimes, not that much though. I used to practice a lot of patterns though. Uh, I have problems, this is Paul, Paul Marino, I'll stick that in the broadcast. I have problems playing middle G on tenor, it comes out upper fifth. Haha, -ha, you're practicing harmonics, overtones, and you never even knew it. Any suggestions how to cope with this? I certainly do. You need to voice the note. So for low notes, your tongue will be in the bottom of your mouth like an aw. Oh. For high notes, your mouth will be in E shape and in the middle it will be kind of ooh or ah type position. So change the angle of your tongue and you'll be able to hit the note straight on without overshooting. Okay, let's see what we got left. Forgive me, I'm gonna have a little sip of water. Why don't I just play you the sting while I'm doing it? I added that echo at the end. It sounds wicked. <laughs> um, Mary Croon. Hope you can do a simple lesson to improvise, maybe as an example on a 12-bar blues. Thanks, Gary. Oh, maybe it's Gary, not Mary. Um, I've already done that. If you go to my special on blues, which was a few weeks ago, 
I demonstrate how to improvise on the blues in three different styles with three different levels of complexity. So back it up and go and watch that video from a few weeks away on the blues, how to play the blues. Jose, let me rephrase. I'm thinking of getting my own sax. What's a good brand or model for intermediate players? Well, yeah, same, same answer. Um, I'd get a Yamaha 32 or 62. Uh, okay. Jazzy PC, Jazzic, Jazzip C, who knows. How would you play low notes on an alto sax softly without creating a warbling tone? What you're talking about is called subtone. And I've got a whole video on it. So go to my channel, search for the subtone video under technique. This is, oh, you're actually talking specifically about alto. Mm -hmm. Subtone always sounds better on tenor, to be honest. But what you do to play subtone is you move your jaw right back and you move your teeth right to the edge of the mouthpiece and you blow with a slow, wide, warm airstream and move your jaw back and you should be able to get that subtone sound. Okay, these questions could go on forever. I'm gonna just, as much as I wanna answer everybody's questions, I'm gonna take three more. Let's find a couple of good ones. Uh, let's have a little looky here. Um, thanks for all your comments and thanks for watching. I really appreciate this. This is awesome. Um, uh, <laughs> what's your favorite? What's your favorite go-to drink after a good gig? I'm guessing a nice whiskey, Joe Glynn. Well, that's an interesting question for another day. But let's just say that 2020, there's been none of the above. Lisa, I got a... Um, yeah, I could answer all these questions. Um, thanks very much, Leonardo. Let's just take one more. Okay. Um, right. Vadzim, how to start low notes quietly, piano. I can start them only loud. That is by using subtone. Now, if you really want to start your low notes super quiet, try not tonguing it and use a subtone. So that's the secret. Um, and the other thing is to have lots and lots of big breath support. What I always say to my students is, imagine the mains uh, pressure behind your kitchen tap, kitchen faucet. If you turn on the tap a tiny bit and a drip comes out, you've still got the force of the mains water pressure behind it. And the same is true of sax. You always need to take a nice big breath and support the sound fully. Thank you so much for all those questions. That was absolutely awesome. I'm very sorry if your question didn't get answered, but hopefully I'll make a bit of a regular feature of these sessions if everyone's enjoying it. Thank you very much, Digital Soldier. Very generous and thanks to everybody else. Uh, very quickly, Eduardo, any 251 improvisation tip? Yes, I've got a video coming up very, very shortly in the next few weeks about 251s. You're in luck. Okay, let's wind it up now. Now, don't forget to go down into the description to get your free PDF for this lesson, which has got all the music, and you'll be emailed with a download link for the PDF. Sometimes it takes a few minutes to come through. And also on that email will be a download link for the MP3 to record to for the competition. Exciting times. Don't forget to go and check out my Saxophone Success Masterclass, which is at getyoursaxtogether.com forward slash masterclass. That link is also in the description. That will answer many of the questions that you've got over there in the comments. So that's all I've got time for this week. Thank you very much. I've really had a lot of fun doing this. I was pretty nervous about doing it because I didn't know what was going to happen. Hopefully the quality and the streaming has worked out nicely. This will be available on replay for all eternity. So 
there will of course be the usual Sunday video, which I can't remember what it is off the top of my head. It might be how to play jazz on saxophone. How exciting is that? But don't quote me on that. So I'll see you on Sunday. Look forward to seeing you there. Thank you very much. And keep watching your emails and your notifications for the next live. See you later.